Good morning, friends. It's early Saturday morning, about 7 a.m., and I'm harvesting for the flower stand. It rained last night, so I wasn't able to harvest last night and make the bouquets in the morning like I normally do. So it will be a little late setting up the flower stand today. But what I thought I would do is, instead of just cutting the flowers and arranging them with you, I'll go ahead and answer some commonly asked questions about cut flowers, post-harvest care, disease and pest issues you might have, maybe processing products that you've heard about and you want to just know my experience with them. And also, I do get a lot of questions about the flower stand itself, how I started, how I come up with pricing, things like that. So I asked on YouTube if you have any questions, I'll be answering those. So let's just get our day started and hopefully we'll have the stand set up by at least nine o'clock. So when it comes to zinnias, I seem to see two questions pretty often. That is, first of all, that the zinnia might be melting down in the vase for you after about one to two days. And the other thing is that they're mucking up the water. So zinnia meltdown is a thing that I have unfortunately experienced multiple years in a row. At first, I didn't know what was happening. And then I started to do some research about it and I've been following the newer research that has been going on. So zinnia meltdown apparently was caused by Fusarium commune. I'm not sure if I'm saying um, that type of Fusarium correctly, but C-O-M-M-U-N-E. And basically it causes a zinnia that looks perfectly fine out in the garden or the field to basically melt down at the neck within about one to two days time. Now, as far as I know, this is relatively new information and they're still doing studies on what we can do out in the garden and in the field to prevent this fusarium taking hold. But there are some people saying that the best way to deal with it is post-harvest. So to put a CVBN tablet into your bucket. So here in my bucket here, we have a CVBN tablet. That's just basically a bleach tablet. It's sold by um, Chrysal, although you can probably buy it other places. You can't actually buy it from Chrysal. You have to buy it from somebody else like Johnny's or the Gardener's Workshop. But I think Johnny's has the best price. But basically put that into your harvest bucket and that should help somewhat. So what I'm doing here is a few things because the hardest part is you don't know you have it until two days later. Maybe you've sold the flowers by now, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe you've sold the flowers by now and they're melting down in your customer's house and that customer, at least in my mind, is probably not going to come back. So all I can do is really keep the area as clean as possible, rotate the zinnias, also, it seems that some zinnias are more susceptible to others. If you look at the studies chart, Binary Giant is actually at the worst in terms of Fusarium commune. So that's why I told you I was liquidating my entire stock of that seed this year. I'm also doing lots more straw flower, not as many zinnias. Sorry, I had to stop there, put my hair down for a second. I think the other thing that can be hard about zinnia meltdown is that if you pick a zinnia, too early, it may do what appears to be the same thing. So if we pick a zinnia before it's ripe and where it's wobbling, oh my goodness, see, look, all around like that, this one's not ready. So as you could see, and this one too, is too immature to cut and it would kind of do that same thing after you harvest it. It would appear to melt down, but zinnia meltdown is different than an immature bloom that's cut and melting down because it was cut too soon in its life cycle. Some other things that you might be dealing with on your zinnias, and I see I'm starting to deal with that now, is powdery mildew caused by high humidity and moisture sitting on the leaves. So this is probably the last cut that I will do on these zinnias before I go ahead and trash them. And for all of these reasons and more, the zinnia meltdown, tarnished plant bug, the problem with zinnias mucking up the water, powdery mildew, and also how my community sees this flower as a very inexpensive and commonly grown flower. I am deciding to move away from zinnias as much as possible and instead replace them with straw flower. In my area, which is Southern Pennsylvania, that's a zone 6B where the weather is wet all the time. You can probably see everything is wet around me. It rains all the time, incredibly high humidity. This is a plant, straw flower is a plant that I can rely on 
and that really has never given me any problems. No pest problems, no disease problems, no powdery mildew, no problems in the vase. Someone asked if there's anything they can do for dahlias that have melted down. I'm not sure if this person left the dahlias outside. Maybe they weren't touching the water in the bucket. I've definitely done that before where you stick them in the bucket and the stems just aren't long enough and they don't get properly hydrated. So just recently, and I want to give full credit to um, Julio over at the Flower Hat for teaching me this, he has a method for rehydrating wilted dahlias. And I went ahead and did that the other day and filmed it for you. So basically what you do is you take your wilted dahlias inside, you submerge them in cold water for 10 minutes. Then you recut the stem, place them in a vase of cool, clean water, and then place them in your refrigerator. Now, I think Julio recommended placing them in the refrigerator overnight. I tried to really track exactly how many hours they needed. I did this with Diva Dahlia, and she needed 12 hours to fully rehydrate, and they were really, really bad. So depending on how bad they are, it might be more like eight hours. But so far, so good. I have kept those dahlias so I can see what happens to them. It's day three. They're on my dining room table and it looks like I still freshly cut them. And I thought maybe this hack is great, but it will decrease the vase life um, substantially following this treatment. But so far, it's working out great. I just checked and I saw that we have a question that came in about Quick Dip. So I do have an older video on Quick Dip. Quick Dip is a post-harvest product. It basically, the best way I can think to explain it is that if we think of the stem of a flower like a straw, sometimes the stem or our straw, what's Grace doing? Sometimes the straw gets clogged and basically then the flower can't drink water. When you're using Quick Dip and placing the stem into the Quick Dip, that basically opens the stem up again and allows the free flow of water up to the bloom head. So in years past, I would use Quick Dip on anything that melted down in the vase. So Mahogany Splendor Hibiscus, Cerinth Major, Dara, Lombata, Dahlias even, Lilacs, things like that. I was just using Quick Dip on them. However, I do feel that it works, but I also think that boiling water works just as well on all of those things. And because I'm trying to decrease what I'm spending all over the place, no more quick dip for me. I just dip the stems into boiling water for about seven seconds. Make sure the steam isn't like coming up onto the flower heads. That can be harmful. Keep the flower heads to the side. But I feel like in terms of boiling water versus quick dip, they work exactly the same and boiling water is free. I saw a question and I think the moral of the question was, when am I using a floral cooler? So I do use an old refrigerator. It's just an old, really kind of nasty looking refrigerator. It's in the garage during the spring and sometimes in the fall. I'm really only putting in tulips, peonies, lilies, and sometimes dahlias into that cooler. And that's mainly because on the shoulders of the summer season, in the summer, I try to sell every single day consistently but a small amount, so four to five bouquets a day, every single day during the summer. And that's really because I wanna be constantly cutting and selling. I don't really wanna be holding a lot of stuff over in the refrigerator. Also, a lot of these annual flowers have different refrigeration needs. So rather than bother with anything like that, I just hold over things like tulips, peonies, and like I say, dahlias. And that's because on those shoulder seasons, I'm only selling on the weekend because our house is a bus stop. And it's not just a once a day bus stop. We have basically four hours where someone is standing directly in front of the stand. The bus stop basically is the stand because the stand kind of goes down there. The, sidewalks, the sidewalk dips down onto the road. So that's the only time when I'm attempting to hold any flowers over for a period of time and bulbs are just incredibly forgiving in terms of cold storage. 
So I just popped inside to check the questions and I'm really, really excited. Let me know if this kind of cut flower Q&A is something you would like to do monthly because this is really why I started YouTube is because when I started, I felt like I had no one to talk to that was experiencing the same kind of problems out in the garden, out in the field that I was. So I'll answer some flower stand questions now and then we can move kind of back to disease and pest problems. So there was one question from a subscriber that I think was a recent subscriber. So I'm really thankful that you decided to join our community. And basically she just wanted to know how I got started with the flower stand, how I advertise it, and how I decide how much to charge for a bouquet. And I can give you a little bit of a life update here as well because how I was advertising the flowers for eight years has changed and it's been kind of a difficult change for me. Look at that, isn't that gorgeous? This would be how I wanna see most of my sunflowers that I'm selling. Unfortunately, I do have one pickup today and those are bereavement flowers and the lady really likes sunflowers. So I'm gonna pick some pretty much fully open for her so the bouquet looks really nice right from the first day. But back to the questions. So when we first moved here, I immediately knew that I wanted to sell cut flowers. This property had been a farmette. There wasn't any grass or anything around. There was a lot more fruit trees and basically the whole yard was dug up and it was being farmed for the purpose of providing food for this Amish man that had been shunned and now he was living basically off the property. I don't believe he had a job. So this really was like a full, production fruit and vegetable area and I imagine he preserved a lot of it as well judging from what we saw in the house when we moved in. All that to say when we moved in I saw that the soil was amazing. He had probably been building the soil up for who knows how long you know I don't know how long he was here for and I had always loved gardening. I had grown up around cup flowers with my grandma and the year that we moved here was I think Cool Flowers had been out for maybe one year and Florette was yet to release her book. So I had a little bit of guidance, but not much. And that first year, I think I've told you, I just planted tons and tons of zinnias all at the same time. Big mistake. But I guess what I'm trying to say is I knew I wanted to sell cut flowers right from the start. That was really where my heart was. This was the first house that we had ever purchased. The property taxes seemed really high to me and I just thought, I wonder if I can have the land pay the property taxes. So my goal has been and continues to be to profit $5,000 in cut flower sales to pay the property taxes. That's always my goal. I have no intent of changing that, scaling up, scaling down. I've just been consistent with that goal. And in terms of how I was advertising, from the beginning, I have been using Facebook. Essentially, I'm selling to friends, neighbors, and locals. I imagine some tourists buy my flowers, but a lot of people, especially now that I use Venmo and I can see the person's name come through, a lot of the people purchasing my flowers are people that I know and love. So I used to use Facebook and every single day that I was open I would post pictures and video of the flower stand I was you know I would say I'm open here's what we have today at the stand and then that was basically my main way of advertising at the very beginning I was also posting in local Facebook groups so just you know my local area I know some people use next door when they get started out but these roadside stands are really common around here. So it's normal to kind of shop the street where I live. With all that being said, a few weeks ago, my personal Facebook account, which of course is linked to my business Facebook account, was hacked and then was quickly deleted. And because of the way they went about this hacking, it seems, oh, I lost that one. It seems that I have lost my Facebook account for good, which on a personal level I could care less about. But North Lawn Flower Farm, the page still exists, but I don't have any access to it because my personal account was deleted. So 
I was a little bit upset about it, but I think it's a good learning lesson that I probably should have been collecting emails this entire time. You know, I should have been collecting emails from customers, collecting emails from Facebook, so that I could send out kind of an email blast every time that I was open. So this wasn't a question, but I thought I would share it in case it's helpful. This is obedient plant when it's green before it blooms. And this will basically last, you know, three weeks in the vase. It might even root. I haven't left it in the vase longer than three weeks. This is about as open as I personally like to harvest it because I do have a small black beetle here. I don't know the name of the beetle, I'm sorry, that does like to congregate on these blooms. It doesn't seem to really do a lot of damage to the blooms, but they are kind of a pain to have to wash off, you know, maybe six beetles per stem. So the earlier I can pick them, the earlier I can pick them, sorry, like this, then I don't have to worry about those beetles. But this is a great spike, perennial, for later in the season. So in terms of the buckets, I saw a question about where do I source these buckets from? These buckets I get for free from Aldi's. If you just go in there, make friends with one of the store clerks, tell them what you do, they trash these buckets. So they will happily collect and save them for you and give them to you for free. Some people asked me about, do people take the jars? Yes, they always take the jars. That is my hope that they take the jars because I want my flowers to always stay in water. I don't, that, I don't want them to be traveling out of water. Those are recycled soft jars from a year's worth of being Italian, I guess you could say. Um, we eat a lot of sauce. Also, the dollar store is a great resource. Right now for today, we're going to be using some dollar store vases that fit in my holders. And my holders are also free. You can get those um, from the wine store. So they're built to hold wine but they will hold sauce jars and the cylindrical vases from the dollar store, they will fit those wine holders and you can get those for free too. Someone is asking about bringing worms accidentally inside the house from their sunflowers. Now, I'm not sure exactly what stage of harvest you're working with, but I would say try to harvest even sooner than what you're doing. Try to harvest that sunflower. If you're having trouble with worms, try to harvest it when none of the petals have lifted off the sunflower yet. In fact, I think I see one that looks like that, so let me go cut it. So for example, can you cut the sunflower like this? Now, if you're cutting it like this and you're still having issues with worms, and I did have issues with worms on the white sunflowers, and that is why I stopped growing them all together. But what you also could do is that when they form the head, but before they really color up and swell out at all, you can use once again an organza bag. Just put the organza bag over the bloom, tighten it up, and then it will protect the bloom head. Depending on how many sunflowers you're growing, that might not be practical at all. But my main solution for the worms was to just stop growing the varieties that seem to have the most problems. And for me, that was white light and white night. None of the yellow and the orange and the dark colored sunflowers seem to attract those worms. I'm not sure why that is, but I haven't had any worm problems since I stopped growing the white sunflowers. Someone asked a great question about what do you do about your dog and your cats getting into the beds when the seedlings are small? So if you're growing in an area where you can install the floral netting really early in the season, I do find that helps with the cats getting into the beds. Now I trained Grace from the beginning not to go in the raised beds. She does seem to understand that. She does walk through my landscape beds, to be honest with you. So if I have anything that's really precious that I don't want her to trample, it will come back here and live in a raised bed. But a lot of what's in my borders are bulbs and they're not blooming until they're much taller, really, really strong stems, and they can kind of handle her walking through those areas. But definitely with the cats wanting to use the raised beds, and if you have cats, you probably know what they like to use raised beds for. I would say install that floral netting from the start and install it really low and then just move it up as you need it. 
at least that works with my cats. Let me know if you guys who also have furry friends have any other tips on that. Someone's asking about a good fall flower that's not a dahlia. So I guess we're kind of seeing very early fall here in my garden. Today is September 10th, no, September 9th. So we're almost at fall. So I would say if you're looking for something other than dahlias, I would just continue to succession plant sunflowers. You can see the succession we were um, at before is in bloom now. That was from saved seed. But in about one and a half weeks, by the time we get to, I would say, late to mid-September flower stand, I'll have another succession of sunflowers in bloom over here in a raised bed. And for me, that just really helps me just pump out focal flowers and flowers with sunflowers in them just sell so well. Another plant that blooms in the fall that I just love is this. It's called Jewels of Opar. When it blooms, it's a beautiful dainty pink bloom. Those blooms quickly fade, turn into these really cool seed pods. The foliage is also really beautiful. It's a lime green. But this is nice if you like frosted explosion grass, but you're just looking for something a little bit different. You might wanna try growing this one year instead and see what you like better. Some people have asked me about the pathways that run kind of in and around my flower borders, making it easier for me to cut the flowers. So I can walk on one of those now for you. So these stepping stones, I probably got these from Lowe's for about a dollar and they go all the way back to the obedient plant. I've just laid them right on top of the soil surface because you really don't see them late in the season. I even cut back some of the peony foliage for you just so you could see it a little bit better. I'll cut some of this dogwood back too. But here's the path right here. Here's another great question from someone. Oh, here's my husband. He's picking some apples and peppers. Best foliage that's not a shrub, not an annual, that's a perennial. Hands down, this doesn't look good at this point in the season, but Solomon Seal. Solomon Seal does best in the shade. I think it is the most elegant perennial foliage that there is. It lasts forever in the vase. You will often see a plant called leather leaf used at the grocery store or by a florist that it lasts forever, just like Solomon Seal, but Solomon Seal is so much more elegant. I grow the variegated variety. I like that even better. It starts blooming right along with the peonies. It still looks okay now. I prune, I'm starting to prune back that burning bush that I told you guys I wanna get rid of. And so I let in a little bit too much light. So that's why my Solomon still isn't looking great at this point in the season. But this is definitely my number one pick. Also now reflushing and not at the appropriate time for cutting. Too wimpy and weak at the moment but this is Baptisia, or Bap how do some other people say it? I don't know, I've always said Baptisia. This is such a wonderful perennial foliage. It looks very similar to eucalyptus, super easy to grow, develops into ginormous plants. You can also, you can use the flowers, you can use the seed pods. I just use it for the foliage. And at this point in the season, I basically cut it really heavily. It's cut all the way back down to the ground. It will reflush like this and give me these short stems before the first frost, but they are generally a little bit too weak to use. Although I could probably sear the end or stick it into boiling water and get this top to stop being floppy or just pick it off too. Someone asked about, do I have ants on my sunflowers? Do I know why that might be happening? And they mentioned that they hadn't really heard people talking about this. That's a really interesting question. I'm really interested to hear what everyone thinks about this. I think I have seen that, but it hasn't become such a problem that I've made any adjustments to growing them, such as I have with, you know, cutting that obedient plant really early because of the beetle or not growing the white sunflowers anymore because of that worm. So let me know what you think about the ants. Maybe it's a sugar thing. There's some kind of sugar up there they like, some kind of scent they're after. Maybe they're eating some other minor bug in the food chain. I'm not really sure. Let me know what you guys think. Someone was asking what hardy annuals I'm growing this year and when I direct sow them in my zone. So I direct sow hardy annuals or cool flowers approximately six weeks before the first frost. 
our average first frost is basically Halloween. It says it's a little bit earlier when you look it up online, but I usually go by Halloween. So it's usually mid-September that I'm going and direct sowing those flowers. I'm going to be doing Bupleurum, Larkspur, Nigella, Orlea, Dara, and that might be it. That, that might actually be it. I'm going even heavier on the bulbs this year. I'm going to do some overplanting of daffodils and see how that works. I want to do two of the raised beds. The back two raised beds get a little bit less sun than all the other ones. So I'm going to permanently plant cut daffodils in those beds and then I'm going to overplant them in very early spring, six weeks before the last frost with more cool flowers. So that's why I'm doing, I wouldn't say any less cool flowers this year, but I'm limiting it to ones that I know over winter really, really well here and are really reliable. Someone asked a really interesting question. It really made me think and evaluate how I designed the main flower walk. And if I could do it again, I would do a lot of things differently. So while I took into consideration the mature size of all of the plants and the trees and I gave them enough room to grow, I really didn't consider, and I don't know why I did this, but I didn't consider the fact that I was creating a shade garden over time in that area. I think I thought because I was putting these plants along the perimeter that it wouldn't block out the sun. But with the way and the angle that the sun moves over the house and over the garage, and is kind of behind the main flower walk for the portion of the day when it's really hot, even things like the Japanese cedar and that big burning bush and just a whole bunch of other things are actually blocking the area from being full sun. And it's being a problem, not only because of sun, but also because you know how we get all this rain here and you know I have a drainage problem over there. Well, now that it's you know more shady and less sunny, it's taking even longer for things to dry out. So I don't know, I can't cut all of these really big things down, but does the main flower walk in terms of the annuals and perennials that I grow there for cut flowers, does that need to, to change and evolve? I think it does. I think I probably have about one more growing season where everything will be all right. And then after that, I might have to grow a lot more shade plants over in that area. Another question that's often asked is, how do I decide which plants to put in the landscape and which to put over in the raised bed? That is definitely a trial and error situation. If a plant is in desperate need of support during its life cycle, so if I need to put floral netting on it, it's definitely going in a raised bed. If it's prone to disease caused by overcrowding, such as the zinnias, it's definitely going in a raised bed. It's gonna go in a raised bed if it's a one and done flower that is an annual. Perennials are okay like that. Annuals, not okay. I don't want that much empty space and that much flipping in my border. Now, what I do want in my flower borders is perennials that are good cut flowers. There's an excellent new book out on that. Here it is, the Cut Flower Source Book. This is all about perennial cut flowers. I highly recommend that book. Totally worth the money. But what I want in my borders is perennials that are good for cutting, shrubs that look good after I cut them, that have multi seasons of cutting value. I wanna think about after I cut the flower that's in the landscape, am I still left with something nice to look at? If I put a single stem of sunflower in the landscape and then cut it, it doesn't look good there anymore. If I put saponaria in the landscape, and it comes to maturity within 60 days and I cut it, then I have a big hole there which I need to fill. But if I put straw flower, gomfrina, celosia in my borders, they are not going to look bad after I cut them, multi-stem celosia that is, they're not gonna look bad after I cut them. The plants are still going to look nice and healthy. They're not prone to disease in my area and I don't have to cut the whole plant at once. I can cut selectively from those plants and still leave behind something beautiful to look at in my border. We cut the jewels of Opar. Now we cut the flower, but we left behind 
that amazing lime green foliage. So I think it's really thinking about, first of all, does that plant need a lot of support? Then I don't want it in the landscape. Is it going to look good after I cut it? Is that area going to need flipped too often if I plant that annual there? And then of course, always just taking into consideration right plant, right place. Well, friends, thank you so much for hanging out with me this morning as we cut flowers and talked about what is probably all of our favorite thing, cut flowers, I'm guessing, if you're here. For now, I wanna get cleaned up at least a little bit before my friend gets here. I wanna wish you all a wonderful day. Let me know if you'd like to do this again sometime, and I hope to see you sometime soon. We've got a really special tour coming up. I'll see you for that. Bye.